for inviting me. I was actually quite surprised because I wouldn't call myself an ML person. <laughs> but yeah, since I, um, I'm working at IBM, I try to combine both like rule language and knowledge graphs, which I have worked before with machine learning. Um, and today I want to um, present two, mainly two projects where we use machine learning to support logical reason, or more formal logic um, representation and reasoning. So one large problem is if you're given very simple fact data, how to come up with a complex, more com but also more compact and more rich um, formal knowledge representation. Or then the actual like logical reasoning. We could also try to learn to do that. Recently, I'm primarily focusing on how we can use the information and knowledge graph during learning, and think that's quite an important and exciting topic, but I won't talk about this too much today, but I'm happy to talk more like offline. Um, also, if you're interested, just uh, or if this something is not clear, just ask during the talk. Um, yeah, I was working for a long, long time on rule languages, and it was always somehow a pity that people are not really using them, because it is really hard to write down rules over large collections of data. You have to know the data, you have to know the domain. So we first started to look into rule learning, but it rather fast turned out that it's not so easy. And like we had also trouble to evaluate our ideas because the current evaluations are actually quite lacking. And therefore, we decided to somehow switch the topic and first to start looking at the evaluation itself. And we created tools for evaluating rule learning systems. So before. I um, describe Root as the tool in more detail. I want to shortly introduce what I mean by rule learning. So you can consider the knowledge graphs we have today as collections of facts which describe relations between entities. For instance, we can say that Anne is the mother of Bob or that Bob is the child of Anne. And the goal is to learn, learn like data log rules like this. For instance, if someone is um, the mother for all x and y, we have that if x is the mother of y, then x is the parent of y. Um, it's even a subset of one clauses. So it's yeah. Um, you can also, um, you must not have existential variables. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can see that such rules a much more compact form of knowledge. For instance, you could, could get rid, rid of the child facts in the knowledge graph, and you could just store one such mother implies child rule, and you would could use this knowledge to um, this rule to retrieve such knowledge. And these rules have been studied for a long time. For instance, also in databases, as for um, under the name like tuple generating dependencies, and they are helpful in that they are human interpretable. You can. If you have such a rule, you can check it and say, it makes sense, I want to learn such a rule. But they can, currently can't um, cope very well with noise, incompleteness, or reasoning that over rules is not very scalable. So there are approaches. Um, but nevertheless, they have been important enough for a very large number of applications. And there has been a lot of research um, about rule learning over time. So the first approaches were somehow exhaustive that, I, that were looking for complete algorithms that definitely found your complex rules. But then when we, we got the first knowledge graphs, it was um, somehow such algorithms there are not feasible anymore. So in the semantic web areas, there are some systems that um, offer approximate solutions, but they could then, could then can better cope with noise. And recently, there are also some neural systems. But as I already mentioned, it's not quite clear how we evaluate rule learning. I mean, what is a good rule? You could look at these rules and say, well, these, the rules containing the parent predicate are better because they are more general. But then you would require your system to invent a predicate if this predicate does not occur in your data, so, which seems to be quite hard. Also, like, there are many more dimensions we haven't considered yet. For instance, over the current knowledge basis, you could learn easily a rule every X who is um, a CEO is male. <laughs> we definitely want 
don't want such rules. So yeah, there are very many dimensions. I won't answer the question, what is a good rule today? But at least we want to overcome some of the um, issues with existing evaluations. For instance, in the existing evaluations, the data sets are usually categorized according to the number of different predicates and constant symbols, so relation and entity symbols you find in the data set. But that's probably not enough. I mean, if you consider a knowledge graph like WordNet, which represents a dictionary, or compared to that, a social network, there might be the same number of entities, but the structure, the patterns, and the data might be very different. So we would need some new categorizations there. And also the data sets are used are not sufficient. For instance, they are from the logical approaches from the Earth, um, early systems, there are some very small toy data sets, data sets which are not very, um, not, not much bigger than the example I presented. So the, sim the facts are often below like 50. And there are, but um, the advantage of these data sets is that you have like, you know which facts are true, you know which facts are false, and you also have some rules given. But the today's systems are usually evaluated over subsets of knowledge graphs, where you have large amounts of facts. It can be um, like millions of facts. But the problem is there we don't have any rules. So this, these evaluations just consider like rules they um, mine by probability, or which they construct themselves, and which are then very, very simple. But there's no agreement on how we can do this in a better way. Very recently, there are also simple synthetic data sets, but these are very simple. For instance, just um, which use templates for the rules and then just gen generate different ones. And then on top of this, there are not really common evaluation measures that capture several dimensions of the problem. So our goal was to do that better and develop evaluation tools for rule learning systems. And we created RUDAS, which contains a generator for synthetic data sets and also evaluation tools. And we generated 100, about 200 like, example data sets, which vary in very different dimensions, which I will describe next. And they come in standard prolog format and are available on GitHub. But yeah, you can use the generator to um, generate some data sets yourself. So our data sets contain domain independent symbols like P1, P0, uh, but like no names like ch child or mother. And you can vary the number of constants and predicates in, your, in the generation. You can also vary the arity of the predicates that we don't, are, we aren't restricted to binary relations, but also that's the standard in the knowledge graphs we have so far. Regarding the fact sets, you can vary the data set size, like XS means like less than 100, S means less than 1,000, and so on. And we consider the incompleteness, that is how many of the consequences are in the data. For instance, it, um, the consequences of the rules we actually consider. For instance, if we have data like this, about moth mo mothers and children, and we have um, the corresponding rule, then we would remove some of the child facts according to the incompleteness degree we give as a parameter. For instance, if we say 20% missing consequences, then we remove those, which models more or less, like, or should model more or less reality where we are usually not given all the consequences. And we also consider noise extra, which means we are missing ground facts. In the rules here, it would be the mother fact. Or we add additional arbitrary facts, like which don't have anything to do with the rules we have. Regarding the rules, we generate them rather randomly, but we consider the number and the maximal length of the rules as parameters. And we categorize rules in different like categories um, according to the dependencies between the rules. For instance, you could consider, you could cha um, consider a chain of rules in which each rule depends on the consequences of the pre previous few rules, so that it can derive new consequences based on the other rule. But you could also 
think of a more like tree structure where it depends on the consequences of different rules or where um, on a like extended tree structure where for one predicate we have actually alternatives to derive those rules. So you could probably come up with much more different rule dependencies, but these are the ones which we started. And you can um, like vary the number of such rule dependencies in our data sets and also the maximal depth, which is here only two, the level of the tree. But yeah, you, of course it gets harder if you have to um, learn longer dependencies between rules. Yeah? So if you're given like facts on P4 and P2, yeah. then we would first have to learn the first rule and the one for P8, and then you could apply those to learn the facts about. Yeah, but uh, so you don't observe that rule either, you just observe facts. Yeah. Okay. And we generate then very many for P4 and P2, and some already for P0 maybe, but the rest would have to be inferred. Yeah. And we provide also different evaluation measures. So the currently the neural projects mostly focus on IR measures like precision recall, F1, and accuracy. But we also um, consider the logical measures which were used in the past, but not in the very new, uh, in the newest papers, like Herbrand distance, Herbrand accuracy, and we suggest a new one, the Herbrand score. So Herbrand distance, it's basically if you have a fact set and once apply all the correct rules and once apply all the learned rules and you co um, consider the distance between the two facts, the number, the facts in which they differ, that's the Herbrand distance. And the Herbrand accuracy normalizes this Herbrand distance basically to the number of facts which can be represented in the alphabet. Um, the Herbrand accuracy can about uh, um, can, um, is not meaningful anymore if you have very many facts in your knowledge base. Therefore, we um, derive or we created the Herbrun score, which um, like solves this that. So the Herbrun score is similar to the F1 score, which basically um, um, favors like the true positives, but it also takes into account the false negatives and the false positives more than the F1 score. I don't want to go into more details there, but like in our experiments, you see that these measures greatly vary, so it makes sense to consider like different measures. So we did some experiments just to show, we didn't want to evaluate like very m the systems themselves, but rather show that our dimensions of the data sets make sense and show that the, um, the systems themselves perform very d different on different kinds of data sets. And we considered four very different systems. So FOIL is one of the very old systems, which considers an exhaustive algorithm. Amy Plus is coming from the semantic web domain and is yeah, tailored to knowledge graphs. And then we have neural LP and NTP, which are um, two of the neural s systems which have been proposed recently. We consider the different metrics and each, is, uh, each score is averaged over 120 set data sets with different kinds of rule categories, sizes, X, S, and S, um, different kinds of depths of the rule graphs, so number of rules, and then um, an incompleteness score of 0 0.3, a missing ground truth of 0.2%, and additional noise of one, um, 10%. And you can see that um, FOIL and AMI are performing relatively good compared to the neural systems, which are really bad. And this isn't shown so directly in the papers because they are missing most, yeah. And a similar um, um, picture we can see if we consider, like if we group the data sets, according to our completeness and noise categories. 
For instance, here we added the even data set, which is one of the toy problems which is used in current evaluations. Um, and you see that the scores, for the, the scores on these data sets are perfect. Are, are perfect. AME plus annual LP couldn't be evaluated on the even data set because it considers unary predicate and they are tailored to binary predicates in the knowledge graphs. And you can see on the complete, very easy data set, FOIL is very good, but it com um, considerably degrades in the, if we have um, noise. AME plus shows a rather rem or remarkably stable performance, but it's not too good. And neural LP and NTP both, both are supposed to work better with noise and incompleteness because you would consider that because they are neural systems. And it's true that they're um, performance does not degrade with noise, but it's in general too low. I think they are just have not been like optimized in this direction. And they are not like, I mean, it's not easy to learn the rules, so I guess there's still much work to do. No. <laughs> you should. Um, yeah, we grouped also according to the rule categories. And there we see a very similar behavior that FOIL is very good. The, the, oh, the systems are very, um, on the very easy chain dependencies, the systems are better. Um, Amy, again, has a rather stable performance compared to the other systems. And here we see that the neural systems really degrade with the rule categories, or rule set categories. And we lastly looked at scalability. So we have different rule um, fact set sizes, and two and three means the number of rules they have to learn. And here you see that even if we only consider like fact sets which have less than 1,000 facts, the S number, then FOIL and also neural LP degrade with larger fact sets, which is actually strange because with larger fact sets, the learning of projects should be better because they have more data they can learn from. So that means that they can't use this amount of data or yeah, cope with this amount of data already. AMI Plus has been like developed for large knowledge graphs and you see that this is reflected in the um, better performance on the large data sets. But you see that it's easier for, to learn only two rules if we have three rules in the dependencies, then it already degrades. And yeah, for NTP, the numbers are not that good, again. Yeah, so I hope that with our work, I mean, we didn't want to um, suggest like the perfect categorization. We just wanted to point out that there are really problems in today's evaluations. And if we want to like create neural rule learning systems, then we should like make sure that we have evaluation approaches which really do their job. Um, yeah, we categorized, or we suggested some categories and showed that the system systems vary greatly in their performance. Yeah, please try the data set generator and this Minerva. Yeah. Of course, there's a lot of future work we can consider other measures or also types of rules. For instance, you could say that 20% of your rules should be like functional rules or equivalence rules. And then the system so far is not very scalable. The, so the generation itself takes some time of large data sets and so on. So there could be some work, but we think we first want to see how people use it and then start optimizing there. Yeah, so in rule learning, we the goal is to learn a formal knowledge base, but in logic itself, then the real task of um, proving conjectures over such knowledge bases actually only begins. And this is um, what we are looking at in a different project. So in, um, TRAIL is a reinforcement-based learning system where we try to learn um, first-order logic reasoning. Um, Reasoning is quite critical for several applications, for instance, to verify the science specifications. But it is, so you want to do, so you want to have some automated support, but because it is really hard. And it is actually undecidable, so you can't write down 
a sound and complete algorithm. There has been a lot of research on building like heuristic um, building reasoners based on manual heuristics, but still there are no automated systems or the the automated systems automated systems we have still struggle with many problems. So the current, currently mathematicians and so on use mainly interactive systems and these systems use standard machine learning techniques um, already, ba mostly based on manual features and these are really helpful. There are some more, like also very recently there's much more work on like reinforcement learning, neural approaches, but these are very domain and vocabulary dependent and often also um, depend on manual features. So our goal was to develop a reasoning system which is independent of manual heuristics and which also is domain or vocabulary independent because you basically would want to learn over problems you have and transfer to arbitrary other problems. You did, would not want to have that this arbitrary other problems had to have to have the same vocabulary, for instance. Yeah, um, I will continue first with my example to show you um, what I mean by logical reasoning. So there you're usually given a set of axioms, which are the formulas you assume to be true, and a conjecture, which you can think of as a query, which we want to either prove or refute. And yeah, we first usually normalize our axioms, um, all the formulas, which is into a disjunction of conjunctions of clauses. So it's very simple in this example. For instance, if we have the rule for all x and y, we have I, if x is the mother of y, then x is the parent of y. We can express it um, similarly as I, either it is the case that x is not the mother of y or x is also the parent of y. And then the goal is to prove, and yeah, I mean, you look at this and say, why, why do we need the automated systems? But for instance, in the like, automated theory prover competitions, the problems look like that. So here you have different axioms which vary greatly in the logical like, operators. They use the formula names, uh, uh, the symbol names are very cryptic. And for instance, the conjecture or part of the conjecture looks like this. So there you really help. An automated system would be very nice. Um, yeah, and our, um, we do proving by refutation. That is, we first negate our conjecture and show that in this, um, in this setting we can derive a contradiction. And this then shows that the conjecture must be true. And the pr proof is a sequence of proof step. And in each proof step, you select a relevant formula. For instance, the one which also contains the predicate child and one inference rule. And here we can use, for instance, resolution, which cancels out, because we know that Bob is not the child of N. And we have, in the, on the right-hand side, we have that um, the child um, atom. So we can derive that N is not the parent of Bob. And if we use our other rule, then we have, then we get the, not, the fact that N must not be the mother of Bob. But we know by our axioms that N is the mother of Bob. So we can derive a contradiction. In this setting, like the learning systems study mostly two problems. The first one is before, do, before the actual proof starts, um, the selection of the relevant axioms. Because if you have, want to prove some mathematical theorem, you can use basically all mathematical theorems which have been proven so far. But these are like thousands, millions. So which ones do you need for your proof? And that would, um, and there are systems, or the question in the systems it is just which axioms, which formulas are relevant, which ones will I use in my proof? So to select this formula set, this is basically the first problem. And the second problem, which I want to also describe in more detail today, is the proof guidance. That is, if you're, um, if you're start within the proof process, you always have the different proof steps and you have to ch um, select one, the relevant formula which you use and the re relevant rule. Yeah. In your model, how do you represent um, negation? Um, we have embeddings for the formulas. I will um, come to this later. Yeah, so 
Our system is a reinforcement learn proving system. Um, here you see the environment. So we use the, a standard um, classical reasoner to get our state representation, but we deactivate the actual decision making. That is, it just performs or yeah performs the actions we select in our reinforcement learning agent. And then we get the state from the agent, select the action, the action, uh, the reasoner performs this action, and so on. Um, yeah, a state consists. A state somehow captures our proof history in that we have two sets: one for book, bookkeeping, where we just have this, um, the previously selected axioms and the proof sequence, and the. And then we always have the applicable axioms. So it's the reason it tells us now you can apply this action, this action, or this action. One action consists of, like as we had before, a relevant, ax a relevant formula and the inference rule, which can be applied. Um, yeah, and in the volume, I want to detail a bit more the actual embeddings of the formulas, also containing the negation then the reward structure and also the learning agent's policy and the training we employ. So as reward, we f first um, very straightforward, consider one divided by the number of steps. Um, the, the intuition is that we want to find shorter proofs because yeah, we favor those. But we also consider two normalized um, forms of this reward. One so that we use the, um, the number of steps we get from an established reasoner and say that this is the best we get, can get, basically. And then we also consider the, um, alternatively, can consider the best reward obtained by in previous iterations over the problems. So uh, we use a standard policy gradient loss um, during training, in addition. Um, Regarding the formula representation, if you consider the, such an example class like below, um, we consider these classes. Uh, uh, so the goal is we want to have a numeric vector embedding like a standard in machine learning. So and um, current approaches actually just, for instance, very many con considered the formula as a string, as it is, without any more logical semantics inside. Then recently, some also considered the tree, tree structure as we do here. But I guess, so I find this topic personally quite um, interesting because there we can actually influence the neural or the learning systems. But it hasn't been studied too far yet. So just recently, there came out a paper from Google on like representing um, logical formulas in higher order logics into like in, within with graph embeddings, but that's only like work which has started now. And we developed for trail first a pattern-based approach where we consider the formulas as um, trees. And then we on each, so um, we set placeholders, here are the stars for all variables first, that is for the x, y, and c. And then we also set placeholders on each level, but leave only one argument as the original symbol. And to have some, like, because some formula may occur in several problems, we attach the ID to the approach, and then we apply, um, then we do pattern hashing to get a numeric, numerical representation in the end. And compared to, we compared this to, like, existing embedding approaches, and it performed quite well. So we're recently doing some, also, um, experiments with graph neural networks. And so far, they haven't outperformed <laughs> this representation yet. Yeah, in the um, reinforcement learning agent, we use a neural network to get our policy. So here we have on the left basically the embeddings we just created on the previous slide. For the actions, we have a clause, and we um, encode the um, inference rule we select as a one hot vector, that is the red part. And then we first create dense embeddings by passing them through fully connected networks and concatenate for the actions the inference rule part again. And then what we want to get is a distribution of the actions with respect to the formulas we have processed or selected in the proof so far. And for this, we use an attention that is 
we, um, that is, we compute the attention between the different actions and the clauses we have selected. And to get one value per action, we do then some max pooling. And to get the distribution, we apply a softbox afterwards. Um, yeah. So now you should have somehow an idea of the picture itself. Um, during training, we um, compared three different training regimens. So first, we applied some random exploration as it is done in Alpha Zero, where we start from a tabular rasa state. That is, we um, randomly initialize our policy, and then we um, rely on that policy with like increasing temperature threshold. That is, we do some exploration in addition, and then we do some supervised training in general using the collected example proofs. And we iterate several times over the problem set, and at each iteration, retain the current policy of its superior in terms of the number of problems in the validation set which it solved. Um, compared to that, we also um, considered an expert bootstrapping approach, where the initial policy, policy is trained in a supervised manner using a model trained by an expert. And then we def um, proceed as in the random exploration approach with the supervised training and yeah. And as something in between the two, so very randomly and the expert bootstrapping, we have an exploratory imitation learning where we rely on actions of an expert, but we have um, a, with an increasing probability select also random actions. Yeah, so currently there's also no agreement in related work which one's like on the perfect setting. So there's, yeah, still room for exploration in general. In our evaluation, we considered like two standard data set. One's MISAR is a large mathematical library and we considered a subset of two, subset of 2K problems. And TPTP is the definitive benchmarks for automotive automatic fearing provers, which also contains 2,000 problems. We set, set a time limit for our prover for 100 seconds, and as baseline, we consider Beagle, which is an established reasoner with competitive performance. And we actually use Beagle also in our system as the reasoner, um, which just creates our state. So it makes sense to compare to it. And and our evaluation actually shows that our system is competitive enough. So TRAIL here solves 57 of the my, percent of the MISO problems and Beagle 61. But actually, like two days ago, we got new results and we are now also at 61. <laughs> so that's quite nice. Um, and we can't compare to other reinforcement learning sets directly because they consider a not so general approach as we do. So they have, um, whereas we just, like we have, we can use any established reasoner, we just have a number of actions we can iteratively apply. So they have a much more assumptions on the um, established reasoner because it has to be a certain kind of like so-called tableau-based reasoning system. And there is an approach which came out, um, came out last year, which does reinforcement learning in this setting, and it achieves like a percentage of 50 problems. But you see that the established reasoning system in that setting um, had 90%. So it's quite good if we in our setting already are at the same performance as the other reasoner. And we also compared like, I mean, that's currently we're doing, or in this setting we do not much different things from the others. But what we wanted to like, yeah, um, primarily focus on was the domain transfer that we can learn on one training set and then test on a different like data set. And we did that on these two data sets. And you can see that it seems at least to work partially. So if we do training on MISAR and testing on TPTP, then f no. If we do training on TPTP but test on MISAR, then the performance is a little lower if, when we do training on MISAR. But if we do training on MISAR and test on TPTP, then it's actually even higher. So it, se 
I mean, in general, the percentages are still low, so there is m much room for improvement. But I think that's an important direction to do. We also, um, to go, yeah. We also compared the different training regimens, but they couldn't ex um, really get some or learn some um, significant difference between them. Um, yeah, so in general, like TRAIL is a novel reinforcement based learning system and it already now shows competitive performance and um, also significant domain generalization and that's really nice. So we were working on that for a long time and have only now come out with the paper because it took quite some time to develop such a large system but now it's quite modular and it can work in, like, um, in smaller groups on like sub-problems. So for instance, we want to um, extend to higher order logics and we want to be very, so we have this sub, this established reasoner we use for our state representation and this should be easily switchable. So currently it's Beagle, but we want to like try with others too. And yeah, I'm personally currently looking at other formula embeddings as I already mentioned, there is some like graph-based neural networks we can try out and get better. Um, so we also had an intern who was looking at a special time um, type of, or a new type of graph neural network, and he considered the premise selection problem. The work is not published yet, but he, um, we got there better results than all like the state of the art. So there's definitely some room impro of improvement regarding these embeddings of logical formulas. Yeah, in general, I'm very much interested in the graph part. So all, I'm exploring graph embeddings not only in this logical setting, but also how we can embed current graph structured knowledge to use it during learning. And like, for instance, you could um, consider if in the vision domain, you have very many problems like image recognition, object detection, where you have in an image, you could say, if there is something which looks like a cat or a lion, well, if there's a child next to it, then it's more likely that it's a cat. And yeah, you could, I mean, this is common sense logic, knowledge which is, should be stored somewhere. So current, there are some very, very basic approaches which already started using such graphical knowledge for like vision tasks. But for instance, there's very, very like much to do still and I st or we started with the NLP setting, where, for instance, you can use knowledge graphs for the recognizing text textual entailment task. Well, there we are given a premise and a hypothesis, and the task is to decide if the premise entails the hypothesis, um, contradicts it, or is mutual with regard to it. And like we started now exploring if we have like knowledge um, graphical knowledge like a subgraph of concept net where we have the concepts which occur in our premise and hypothesis and they are connected by different relations. So currently I'm focusing on that part like how I can encode this graphical ex knowledge and encode, um, add it to the standard learning because these tasks are usually or so far basically um, decided by like using transformer models like LSTMs, BERT recently, but external knowledge has not been yet considered and it's very likely that for several of the questions you need some external knowledge to decide. So I guess there's, yeah, there are still many open questions in this area. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. So the trail paper should be on archive in like two days or so. <laughs> we are <laughs> submitted it already. But yeah, you can ask me, yeah, or approach me if you're interested in any of the problems and so on. I guess we can easily like collaborate over the AI Horizons network, so yeah. Thank you so much.